So, hello. Uh, thank you to everybody who is here in this uh, webinar. It's a, a big pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, uh, Professor uh, Francesco Ricci. Uh, uh, we know each other since many years. Uh, it has been always a pleasure being in contact with Francesco uh, since the time we have been working and collaborating with the uh, University Tor Vergata and uh, Professor uh, uh, Paleski, uh, where uh, Francesco Ricci has been working and doing his PhD. And since that time, uh, he's uh, a full professor at chemistry department of University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Uh, Francesco's research is uh, in the field of uh, DNA functional nanotechnology, uh, DNA-based uh, sensors, aptamers, uh, conformational switching probes. Uh, he has been working in smart drug release and electrochemical sensors. After his PhD in 2005 in University of Rome, Tor Vergata, Francesco spent two years as visiting postdoc a researcher at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, he has been uh, turning, he turned back in, in, in Rome. Francesco has been awarded an International Marie Curie Outgoing Fellowship in 2010. He got an ERC starting grant in 2013, and uh, recently in 2019, he got uh, again the ERC Consolidator Grant uh, for his excellent research and proposal, of course. Uh, Francesco is also a recipient of the 2017 ACS Advanced in Measurement Science Lectureships Award. And also in 2017, another award, Heinrich Emanuel Merck Award in Analytical Science. He has published more than 100 papers in the IC peer review journal, uh, very good journals, publications in JAX, NAS, and Evander Shinin Nano Letters, uh, with a lot of citations, uh, around 5,000, and uh, high in the index, uh, 45. So it's really a big pleasure to have uh, Francesco in this webinar. I thank you again, Francesco, for accepting to share with us your knowledge, your fantastic research. So it will be a, a, a pleasure now to, to hear you and learn more about your research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Arben, for this uh, very nice introduction. So let me share my, my screen and uh, uh, thank, thanks for uh, this uh, nice invitation. It's a real pleasure to, to give this uh, webinar. For me, it's the first webinar. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, uh, I hope everything is going well for everybody, despite the bad times, both for Italy and Spain. Uh, and um, so, uh, as, you, as you can see from, from uh, the title of my talk... Sorry, one, th one thing, Francesco, I forgot to say to the audience that uh, you have the possibility to write questions. There is a button uh, uh, in the, uh, there in the screen, in the bottom part, uh, uh, questions and answers. So uh, please feel free to write questions. At the end of the talk, uh, I'll read these questions and uh, uh, Francesco will be answering. Sorry for interrupting, Francesco. No yeah. problem, no problem. So I was just saying that as you can tell from the title of my, of my talk, today I will, uh, I will uh, uh, show you some examples on uh, DNA-based uh, uh, nanodevices that can be used for diagnostic anti antibodies and can be controlled by, by antibodies. So um, before going into the details of this, uh, of this work, uh, I, I want to give you first uh, uh, an overview of the field uh, uh, we are involved in. Uh, so this is uh, uh, DNA nanotechnology. Um, this is a quite uh, new and growing field where uh, basically we uh, use DNA uh, as an engineering material. So we are talking about synthetic DNA. Uh, we are not interested in DNA as a career of the genetic information, but we use again synthetic DNA as uh, a material to build uh, uh, nanoscale devices, uh, um, machines, and the structures that can have different applications. So uh, very briefly, I want to you know, highlight what are the advantages of using uh, a DNA as a material. Uh, first of all, a DNA is quite easy to synthesize. It has a low cost. Now there are many uh, companies uh, in, the, in Europe, in the world, where we can uh, order a specific sequence of DNA. Uh, um, it will be delivered in you know, a few days uh, uh, for um, a very uh, 
few few euros. So it's uh, it's really a low cost material and, and very easy to synthesize. Uh, the, the 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 beauty uh, regarding uh, synthetic DNA is the fact that uh, we can easily attach different molecules on the DNA backbone. So this can be used to attach different, for example, recognition elements, as I will show you during this talk. Uh, we can also attach different uh, um, signaling labels. Um, Obviously, uh, DNA is biocompatible, which is, uh, is very important for clinical applications. And uh, uh, the other very important feature of uh, uh, synthetic DNA is the fact uh, that uh, its uh, chemistry uh, is, is really is easy. So we can easily predict, uh, uh, for example, secondary structures of uh, short sequences of uh, DNA uh, using uh, online uh, uh, free uh, softwares. Uh, and, uh, and again, this is uh, something that, uh, as I will show you in this talk, is for us extremely important. Um, so in this field, uh, uh, there are many different uh, you know, branches. Uh, uh, there is one very interesting that is called structural DNA nanotechnology, where basically uh, many different uh, synthetic DNA sequences are rationally designed to uh, interact one to each other to form uh, uh, nanoscale uh, structures or objects of defined geometry. This is the seminal work by Paul Rothman in 2006, uh, where he was showing uh, you know, these uh, this very nice structures made of uh, uh, synthetic DNA strands. Uh, more recently, uh, more complex structures can also be uh, be made using DNA. So basically, DNA can be seen as a Lego brick that uh, interact with uh, with other sequences in a very predictable and um, uh, programmable way, so that we can also build three uh, D structures. Um, we can also uh, build uh, um, uh, simpler and uh, uh, smaller. Uh, devices made of DNA uh, that can respond to different inputs. So we can, uh, uh, for example, design nano switches or nano machines that can change conformation or uh, um, uh, make a, a, a function in response to uh, uh, the recognition of a specific input. This is something obviously that we are uh, more interested in uh, since uh, as Arben was mentioning, uh, our background is in analytical chemistry. So we are always uh, you know, interested in uh, developing tools that can have uh, uh, sensing applications. So the general uh, uh, philosophy in in our in our group is to uh, try to build uh, nano switches or nano devices uh, using synthetic DNA that can have a diagnostic or drug uh, release application, and uh, we we try to do this by looking at nature. So by by uh, trying to uh, recreate natural occurring mechanism to make this uh, these um, uh, devices. Uh, so these are some examples of, of our work. This is a very general and quick uh, uh, overview. Uh, so uh, in, in, a, in a research uh, direction, we want to recreate a natural occurring mechanism to make the response and behavior of these uh, nano devices uh, more easy, easily controllable. So we recreated, for example, uh, allosteric uh, cooperativity or uh, out of equilibrium uh, uh, systems. And uh, in, uh, in another uh, research direction, instead we <coughs> um, uh, designed in a rational way uh, nano devices made of uh, synthetic DNA that can, be, uh, that can respond to different inputs. So for example, we designed uh, um, uh, pH responsive uh, uh, nano switches, uh, devices that can respond to enzymes or transcription factors, and uh, devices that can respond to antibodies, and this is this will be the focus of my of my talk today. Uh, and I think uh, it, this really uh, uh, perfectly uh, uh, depicts the uh, advantages of using synthetic DNA for this type of uh, of applications. Uh, well, very briefly, uh, the importance of, uh, of antibody detection. There's, during this period, it's not really uh, needed uh, this, this uh, slide, uh, but uh, just to give you a, an overview, this is the uh, market business in uh, in vitro diagnostic. As you can see, immunochemistry, so everything that uh, regards 
uh, either antibody detection or the use of antibody as recognition element is a, a very big uh, slice of the market uh, with a yearly uh, uh, steady increase. And obviously, uh, major players are always looking for new ways to detect antibodies, uh, new ways that are uh, sensitive, that are specific, and that are rapid and uh, cost effective. Um, and th the reason why they are always looking for these new methods is uh, usually I, I, I give you this, this, uh, this uh, example. So a couple of slides. Uh, going back to about 40 years ago, this was, uh, I guess everybody recognized this movie. This was the first movie that I saw when I was a kid uh, in, in, a, in a theater. Uh, and uh, if you remember the movie, at a certain point, uh, E.T. was uh, you know, taken by bad guys to, uh, in, a, in a lab. Uh, and uh, they were making all sorts of uh, tests. And then uh, they were using this instrument. So if you were not uh, too busy crying at that point, you could uh, see that uh, this instrument is actually uh, um, an ELISA a microplate reader. So this uh, is just you know, to say that uh, um, ELISA has been uh, uh, around for many years, uh, more than 40 years. Uh, and it's still uh, the uh, one of the most used technique for antibody detection. Um, and uh, right now, we you know with uh, with COVID nineteen, uh, we know the importance of serological tests. And uh, ELISA is actually uh, one of the you know uh, true uh, approaches together with lateral flow immunoassay that uh, has been has been used. Um, ELISA is a, is a great uh, uh, technique, but uh, as, uh, um, as you know, if you have run an ELISA uh, uh, assay, you know that uh, it's uh, time consuming, it uh, requires a lot of reagents. So it's not the best technique if you want uh, a rapid response. So uh, this is uh, you know, what uh, we try to, to, to overcome. So we, we, we want to use uh, uh, synthetic DNA to make uh, tools that can be used for antibody detection that are you know, uh, rapid and, and sensitive uh, and, uh, and can uh, um, overcome these limitations. So today I will show you uh, a couple of examples in this uh, direction. Uh, they are not just for diagnostic applications, but uh, they are also for possible drug delivery applications. All right, so uh, I will start with the first example. Um, as you will see in, in all these examples, we will use a synthetic DNA and we will make advantage of the geometry of antibodies. I will, I will show you in a moment. So in this case, we, are, um, we, we, we um, designed a programmable nucleic acid nanodevices that can be used for the rapid single step detection of antibodies. Uh, in this case, and also in the, in the next examples, we use uh, a co-localization Mechanism. So you remember I, I say that uh, we always uh, you know, try to uh, take inspiration from nature, and this is one of the most used mechanisms in, in, in nature. So the co-localization of reagents in a confined volume to uh, accelerate or trigger a reaction that otherwise would not be possible uh, at, uh, in diluted uh, solution. So uh, we will use this mechanism, but first of all, we will use the uh, antibody uh, specific geometry. And uh, just to, you know, everybody knows this, but just to um, be on the same page. So IgG antibodies, which are, you know, the majority of antibodies that we actually want to measure, uh, share, uh, they all share a common geometry. They have uh, two binding sites, okay? So these are two identical binding sites. Uh, that are separated by about 10, 12 nanometers. Okay, all IgG antibodies share this uh, same geometry. And so what we want to do is to uh, uh, take advantage of this geometry to uh, create a, a sensing tool based on synthetic DNA. So um, what we did is, uh, the idea is, is really easy. So as you can see, we have uh, uh, different uh, strands of uh, uh, synthetic DNA. I will, uh, will go step by step just to, to make sure that everything is clear. So we have, uh, first of all, uh, a DNA strand that you can see here that is designed to adopt a stem loop conformation. Okay, remember I told you that uh, DNA is really programmable. We can easily predict the secondary structure. So making a strand like this is really easy. So we, we uh, uh, design this portion here, which is about five or six bases, to be complementary to this portion. 
Okay, so if we have a adenine in here, here we have a timine. If we have a cytosine here, we have a guanine here, and so on. Okay, so this will be very easy. Uh, here we have a loop that uh, uh, it's about uh, uh, 15 uh, bases, and here we have a tail that is also about 20 bases. Okay, and then we have uh, uh, this uh, uh, strand is labeled with a, a quencher and a fluorophore. So again, remember that uh, uh, synthetic DNA can uh, we can easily attach different molecules. So this can be uh, you know synthesized in a very uh, easy way without much problem. Okay, so this will be our uh, reporter. So this will uh, be the, uh, the, the, the thing, the strand that will give us a signal. Now we need something that recognizes the antibody, okay? And here we have uh, two strands. The first one is this uh, uh, pink strand. Uh, this is again a sequence of DNA uh, that is complementary to this uh, tail here. Okay, so when we put this strand together with this strand in a solution, they will bind and form this module, okay? And then this strand of DNA is also uh, labeled, conjugated with a recognition element. And obviously, when we talk about antibody, uh, the recognition element is uh, uh, an antigen, okay? Something that is recognized by, by the antibody that we want to detect. Okay, so these uh, uh, two strands will be what we call the reporter module. And then we have what is called the input strand. So this is a DNA strand, as you can see, that has uh, this portion here complementary to this loop, okay? Then we have a tail. This sequence here is not very important, so it's about 20 bases, but it's random. And then uh, at this end, we also have another uh, recognition element, another antigen. So remember, this is the same molecule here, Okay, and again, this is the molecule that is recognized by the antibody we want to detect. So the uh, general idea of this approach is really easy. What we want to do is uh, we want to design this uh, strand so that it will bind here, okay, to this loop. Remember, this is complementary to the loop. So when it binds here to the loop, it will open the loop. The fluorophore will be, you know, forced away from the quencher and we see a signal increase. But the key in this strategy is to design this interaction so that it's not stable enough under the uh, nanomolar concentration we usually use for, for, this, uh, uh, for our experiment. So basically, when we have these strands and this strand in the same solution at nanomolar concentration, there is no interaction. Okay, the affinity of this strand for the loop is not high enough to have this uh, uh, binding and to see a signal increase. Okay, but now uh, if uh, we have the uh, specific antibody in solution, what happens is that the antibody, remember it has two binding sites, will bind to the uh, antigen here and will bind to the input strand here, uh, and then will co-localize the uh, reporter module and the input strand into a confined volume. So this means that now these two um, uh, modules uh, will be uh, um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a very small volume, so the effective concentration will increase. And this means that now the interaction between this strand and this loop can occur. Okay, so only when the antibody is present, we will see this interaction and we will see a signal increase. So again, this is a very simple uh, idea. Uh, it's not new. I mean, the, 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 the use of co-localization is not something new. It's new, the fact that we are using uh, uh, synthetic DNA to, to make this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, platform. And uh, uh, um, so to, to make this uh, idea work, what we need is uh, uh, we need to, 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 to uh, you know, respect some condition. First of all, this interaction should not occur in the absence of the antibody. Okay, this is important. Uh, otherwise, uh, but the, the reaction should occur when the antibody is present. Okay, so we have to find the right thermodynamic trade-off to, uh, to have this, uh, this kind of behavior. Okay, so if we make this interaction um, of uh, uh, too poor affinity, then even in the presence of the antibody, the reaction will not occur. Okay, so we have to find the right trade-off. And to do this, we can, play with, uh, with different things. We can play with the uh, length of the strand, okay? So the uh, uh, number of bases that interact with the loop, 
okay? So as we increase the number of bases that, that interact with the loop, we increase the affinity, okay? So we can play with this, but we can also play with the stability of this uh, structure, okay? So if we make this structure very stable, then the affinity will uh, decrease, okay? We have a, a, a poorer affinity. If we make this uh, structure less stable, then the affinity will improve. Okay, so we can play with many things. And as I say, the beauty of DNA, DNA, is, uh, DNA, DNA interactions is that uh, they are really uh, predictable. So we can uh, you know, um, uh, easily find this uh, thermodynamic trade-off by using different sequences and by you know, testing them in the absence and presence of the antibody. And this is what we did. So we started with uh, a very simple uh, antigen antibody couple. Okay, so as you can see here, we use the uh, D, uh, DNP, which is dinitrophenol. Uh, this is a small molecule that is very easy to attach to DNA. So the reason we are using it is just for you know, a practical reason. Uh, and uh, and um, anti-DNP antibodies are commercially available. Okay, so this is, you know, uh, it's not a clinically relevant uh, target, but it's uh, very good for, you know, uh, initial testing. And as you can see here, we, we, we test the affinity of this trend for the, uh, for the reporter module. Okay, here you can see this is a binding curve, uh, the increasing concentration of the input strand. In the absence, okay, this curve, and in the presence of the antibody. Okay, and uh, uh, this is exactly what I was telling you. So uh, in the presence of the antibody, we see uh, an improvement of the affinity. So uh, basically what happens is that if we you know, do this uh, test at this concentration of uh, uh, DNA input strand, uh, in the absence of the antibody, we don't have uh, uh, much binding. Okay, so a low signal. And then in the presence of antibody, we see a signal increase due to the formation of this complex. Uh, we can uh, um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, as I said, we, we, we went through a, a thermodynamic optimization. I will not bore you with uh, details about this. So uh, this will be the results with the optimized uh, um, uh, sequences. Uh, and um, uh, and, uh, and as you can see here, uh, in the uh, in the presence of by adding increasing concentration of of the specific antibody, we see a signal increase. Uh, this uh, behavior is obviously you know concentration dependent, and uh, we can reach uh, sensitivities that are in the range of uh, nanomolar concentration. Uh, the good thing about this uh, platform is that it's really specific. So it only, you know, we have a signal only when the antibody, uh, when the specific antibody is present. So here you can see the signal in, um, in the presence of the specific antibody. And then the signal that we got with uh, uh, non-specific antibodies. Uh, this is a nice, uh, uh, a nice control here. As you can see, this is a fab fragment. So basically, this is only the portion of the antibody with one binding site. Okay, so this is the fab fragment that uh, um, recognizes uh, uh, DNP. Okay, and as you can see, it doesn't give you uh, give us any any signal uh, suggesting that uh, um, that this is this indeed is. Uh, um, the mechanism uh, we are observing. Um, the, uh, the other uh, nice thing about this platform is that uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's actually uh, really uh, versatile, okay? So um, in principle, we can detect uh, uh, any antibody by just changing the recognition element on the uh, uh, DNA strands. And we demonstrated this by, um, uh, by, by designing uh, three different uh, uh, systems uh, with three different uh, uh, antigens. So again, we have DNP, like the same we used before. And then we use the uh, digoxygenin, which is again a small molecule that is also easy to attach to DNA. Uh, and then we used also P17. So this is... Uh, um, uh, a peptide that is recognized by anti-HIV antibodies. Okay, so this is a clinically relevant, uh, you know, target. Uh, and and then uh, all these sequences are different. Okay, and they have uh, they are modified with a different fluorophore. Okay, so what we did was to 
put all this in the same solution, okay? And, uh, and uh, as you can see, so these four four give a signal at different wavelengths, okay? So the idea is that we can actually uh, measure in an orthogonal way, so in the same solution, these three uh, antibodies uh, without any cross reactivity. And this is what we show here. So uh, as you can see, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the three signals obtained uh, with the three systems. Okay, so uh, when we only add the anti dig antibody, we see signal increase only from this uh, system. If we add the anti DNP antibody, we see the increase only from this system. If we add the uh, anti HIV antibody, we see the increase only for this uh, from this switch. And of course, if we use different combination, okay, we see only the specific uh, uh, signals that we expect. Um, Last slide on this uh, system, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we thought that uh, this, uh, this platform was uh, uh, particularly suitable to follow, um, uh, to monitor immunotherapy. You know that, uh, uh, you know, uh, antibodies are extremely important also as a, a therapeutic agent, okay? Uh, immunotherapy is really exploding in this, uh, in this period, uh, but uh, it's really important to follow and to monitor immunotherapy efficacy by measuring the level of antibodies uh, in the patient during the treatment, okay? And this is what we, we did in this example. So uh, we, um, uh, we measured anti-80-20 antibodies. So these are um, uh, antibodies that are used uh, as uh, um, um, you know, a therapy for, uh, um, uh, for, for a specific disease. Uh, and um, uh, as you can see, okay, this is the, you know, the binding curve for this, uh, for this uh, antibody. Uh, in this case, we use as a recognition element a peptide. And as you can see here are uh, 10 samples from 10 patients, uh, where the red ones are those that have been treated with, uh, with this uh, immunotherapy and the uh, green ones are those that uh, uh, have not been uh, uh, treated. So uh, in principle, this platform can also be used for detection and monitoring of immunotherapy. So just uh, as a uh, brief conclusion on this first part, uh, uh, this platform is uh, you know, sensitive. Uh, here, obviously, we have to do a, a big uh, disclaimer because uh, uh, we cannot reach the sensitivity the sensitivity which with ELISA. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is very important to to um, to specify uh, because we don't have an amplification step. Okay, which is uh, obviously crucial for ELISA to reach very low sensitivities. But for some applications, this uh, uh, the sensitivities that we obtained would be would be enough. Uh, a, a low volume is required, it's uh, rapid, it's low cost, and in principle could be applied to home tests. And uh, it could be adapted to other uh, signaling mechanisms, uh, for example, um, electrochemical. All right, so um, now I want to, to, to show you a, a second example, which I think is also uh, interesting from uh, this point of view, uh, and uh, in, in which we uh, uh, designed and, and developed uh, DNA strain displacement reactions that can be controlled by antibodies. And as I will show you, this could have different kind of applications in the short and maybe in the, in the longer term. Again, also in this case, we are using a co-localization mechanism. Um, before going into you know, the, 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 the results, I, I first want to give you an introduction regarding a very important uh, uh, reaction that is called DNA strain displacement. Uh, this is a, a, a very important reaction in the field of DNA nanotechnology. It's a simple reaction, but uh, it's really easy to control. And, and for this reason, it's been used for you know, many different uh, type of, of applications, as, as I will show you later. Uh, but uh, but uh, before going into details, I want to show you the reaction. It's, it's really easy. So we have uh, a duplex DNA, uh, okay, made with these two uh, complementary strands. And one of these, the, the two strands have, has a, a single strand portion, okay, which is called told. Uh, now, if we add an input strand, so a strand of DNA uh, that uh, 
it has a complementary region to the told, what happens is that this uh, strand will bind to the told, and then the green strand that uh, is complementary to the blue strand here will start invade to invade the the duplex. Okay, and so what happens is that after a while, the uh, the, the the complete duplex uh, with uh, the blue strand and the input strand will be formed, and this uh, uh, you know pink strand will be released. Okay, so again, it's a very simple uh, reaction, but uh, it's uh, extremely well controlled and uh, um, and very specific. Okay, so this uh, has uh, you know uh, many different applications, and what we want to do is to control this uh, reaction with antibodies. Again, we are taking advantage of the specific geometry of, uh, of uh, IgG antibodies to do this. And the, also in this case, the idea is really simple. So you remember we have the input strand here that is made of two portions, the portion that binds to the told and the portion that invades the duplex, okay? So what we did was to uh, split this uh, input strand into two uh, portions, told binding portion and invading portion. Then what we did was to uh, design uh, two tails on both uh, split uh, uh, strands, okay? And uh, in this case, we have uh, a, a sequence here in, in, in black, which is uh, you know, a random sequence, not very important, just to give some flexibility. And then we have an orange sequence here, which is uh, you know, about uh, uh, from six to 10 bases, I will, I will show later. Uh, and, and the same with this other uh, split input strand. And these two uh, portions here are complementary to each other. Uh, then the two uh, split uh, uh, input strands also uh, are conjugated with uh, uh, an antigen, so a recognition element, okay? Again, this is to recognize the target antibody. So the idea here is really simple. What we want to do is uh, we want these two portions that are complementary to form a duplex that is not stable enough at the nanomolar concentrations we usually use in our experiment. And uh, I guess you, you know where I'm going. So in the presence of the antibody, the antibody will bind to the true recognition elements, will bring into uh, a confined volume the true uh, split input strands, and, uh, and then at this uh, point, the effective concentration of them will, will, uh, will, will increase, and then this duplex will be uh, uh, stable enough to form, okay? And so basically we uh, form the active input strand, so an input strand that has the total binding domain and the invading domain only in the presence of the antibody. So this is the, the general idea. Again, it's really simple. And to demonstrate this, what we did was to uh, start with uh, you know, a, a target duplex. Uh, we, we, we made the inputs, the, the split inputs, and we uh, labeled the target duplex with a floor for the branch. So that uh, basically when we see a signal increase, uh, is because the reaction is taking place. So uh, when, when the uh, reaction occurs, this strand that is labeled with the fluorophore is released. Okay, so we see a signal increase. Uh, now what we need to do is to, you know, select an antigen and an antibody. Uh, again, also in this case, uh, uh, we are using a, <coughs> a very simple antigen. We are using digoxygenin and the antibodies are obviously uh, anti-digoxygenin antibodies. And, uh, and also in this case, we have to find a thermodynamic trade-off. Okay, so we want this uh, a duplex, okay, here uh, to be unstable in the uh, absence of the antibody and to be stable in the presence of the antibody. And to, to make this uh, um, trade-off, we need to, again, uh, uh, play with the sequence of, of DNA. So we can play with the length of this so that uh, we can find the right uh, uh, tuning, okay? And this is what we did. Here you can see this is the length of this uh, uh, duplex portion here, okay? So we go from zero nucleotides to 14 nucleotides. And here you can see uh, the, the results that we obtained. And uh, uh, 
so as you can see, when the stem is long enough, so for, uh, 12 or 14 nucleotides or even 10, uh, we will see a, a, a reaction occurring also in the absence of the antibody. Okay, so this is something that we don't want. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, as you, we decrease the length of the stem, we, we see that the reaction is, you know, uh, is uh, more and more um, uh, disfavored. And, uh, and then in the presence of the antibody, we can see that uh, we, we, the, the reaction occurs all, also with the six and eight nucleotide stem, okay? Uh, with the four nucleotide stem, the reaction is really not efficient. And obviously with the zero nucleotide stem, even in the presence of the antibody, no reaction occurs. So uh, at the end, we choose uh, a, a length of six nucleotides uh, for this stem for you know, uh, next experiments. And, um, and again, as you can see, we, we, we started with, uh, with the digoxygenin as the antigen. And, uh, and uh, here you can see the uh, uh, strain displacement reaction that uh, occurs at increasing concentration of the uh, anti-dig antibody. Uh, again, also in this case, we have a nanomolar sensitivity. Um, and also in this case, this is uh, very important, the uh, reaction is extremely uh, specific. So we only see the signal uh, in the presence of the specific uh, target antibody. So when we have no specific antibodies like this one, we don't see any signal. Also in this case, when we use the FAB fragment, so only the fragment that has one binding site, we don't see any, any signal. And also when we use uh, split input strands where only one of them is conjugated with, uh, with an antigen, we don't see any signal. And, and uh, as a control here, we use the uh, input strands that are complete. So as you can see, in the presence of the antibody, we really uh, obtain the same results and the same signal that we obtain with the you know, complete input strand. Uh, also in this case, this uh, approach is extremely versatile. So basically we can easily um, change the recognition element and detect another antibody. So here, what we did was to use uh, dinitrophenol again as an antigen, uh, and we detected anti-DNP antibodies. Uh, again, we have you know, nanomolar sensitivities, and again, a very good specificity. Uh, if, uh, like we did in the other work, if we use uh, different sequences, and if we use a different fluorophore, we can use uh, uh, these two reactions in the same solution, and they will be activated only in the presence of the specific antibody. So here you can see the signal of these uh, two systems in the same solution. Uh, then when we add the uh, uh, anti-DIG antibody, we see the signal increase only for this system. If we add anti-DNP antibody, we see an increase of the signal of uh, only the other system. And if we add both antibodies, we see both signals increase. Um, all right, so uh, this is uh, you know, uh, it for, for the, the, the sensing applications, but uh, I, I just want to show you as a final thing. I hope uh, I'm not uh, too late. It's gonna be probably other three, four minutes uh, because I want to show you another possible application. So the, the, the possibility of using uh, uh, antibodies to control the assembly and disassembly of DNA nanostructures. So you remember I told you that uh, uh, with the synthetic DNA, we can create uh, 2D or 3D uh, structures of defined geometry. Uh, and this is what we want to, to show. Okay, so we want to show that uh, uh, actually we can control the assembly of these structures using, uh, uh, using uh, antibodies. Um, so to do this, we uh, uh, again, we, uh, you know, we started with this uh, uh, strain displacement reaction. That is, uh, as, I, as I told you, uh, finds many applications in the field of DNA nanotechnology. And one of these applications is to create and, uh, and trigger the assembly or disassembly of uh, uh, nanostructures. In particular, we use the uh, DNA nanotubes that are you know, tubular structures made of uh, uh, synthetic DNA. And the idea is that uh, by uh, uh, adding uh, a uh, what we call an invader, we can uh, destroy the tubes and adding what we call an anti-invader, we can assemble the tubes, okay? And all this uh, can be done with uh, DNA strain displacement reaction. So here you can see the circuit we used. 
So basically we have a strain displacement reaction triggered by an antibody. Uh, the antibody uh, the, uh, controlled reaction releases what, we, what is called a day protector, which will activate the tiles that will trigger assembly of DNA nanotubes. Um, and uh, here you can see this is uh, uh, a circuit controlled by anti-DIG antibodies. As you can see, in the absence of antibody, we don't see any, uh, any nanotubes structure. And only in the presence of anti-DIG antibodies, we, we see uh, these, these structures. Uh, we can obviously control these structures assembly with other antibodies by just changing the recognition element. And again, in the absence of the antibody, uh, um, against an, uh, DNP, we don't see any structure, and only in the presence of this antibody we see the structure. And finally, also in this case, we can you know, uh, regulate in an orthogonal way this, uh, this structure, so we can have two different uh, tiles labeled with different uh, fluorophores in the same solution, and basically when we add uh, uh, the antibody for this structure, we see only this uh, red structure, when we add the antibody for this structure, we only see this other structure. If we add both antibodies, we see both structures in the same solution. And we can also uh, 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 design a circuit so that we can release a, a, a strand that uh, triggers the assembly and, uh, and another circuit that uh, with another antibody releases a strand that uh, disassemble the tubes. So in principle, well, what we show here is that uh, without antibodies, we don't have any structure. Then we add this uh, uh, specific antibody for this circuit. We release the day protector that trigger the assembly. And so we see nice uh, structures. And then we add this other antibody that activates this uh, circuit that uh, leads to the release of this strand that disassemble a structure. And so we don't see any structure here. So uh, here we demonstrated that uh, uh, you know, uh, antibodies can also be used to control the assembly and disassembly of structure uh, made of DNA. Uh, the applications in this case are, you know, as I said, in a, uh, in a longer term uh, and it could be, for example, used for uh, imaging purposes or for uh, drug delivery uh, purposes. Um, with this, I, I finished. Uh, I hope I, uh, I, I really demonstrate to you that using synthetic DNA is, is uh, you know, has many advantages. Uh, it's a, a predictable and a programmable way to create um, uh, nanoscale devices and tools that can have uh, different applications. So this is uh, uh, part of the group. Now it's uh, slightly uh, grown. Uh, these are the people that uh, took part in this research, uh, Simona, Alessandro, Daniela, and Andrea that is actually in Arben's group now that uh, actually started one of these of this projects a while ago when uh, he was in, in my lab. Um, obviously, funding is also knowledge, and uh, if you want to know more, you can visit uh, our uh, lab website. And uh, I thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for this uh, very, very nice, interesting talk, uh, the fantastic research you are doing in Rome. So uh, now we have time for questions. In fact, uh, 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 there is a question here in the bottom. Uh, so from Liming, uh, she is uh, uh, thanking you, of course, uh, Liming Ku, I think from my group. Uh, and. Uh, uh, she thanks you uh, for this nice talk and she is asking about this uh, displacement part. Uh, why must use two kinds of antigen uh, split input? Uh, just one kind uh, may be probably also useful. What is uh, the reason and what do you think about this? Um. I'm not sure I understand completely the, the question. Uh, maybe it's uh, regards the uh, orthogonal uh, demonstration that we, uh, we, we demonstrated. Uh, if, uh, if we use uh, the same sequences, then there will be uh, cross reactions. So we, we need to use different sequences uh, in order to have uh, a really orthogonal um, uh, reaction, meaning that only uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> the specific antibody can can trigger uh, that uh, specific reaction. 
So I, I don't know if I understood this correctly, but uh, I think so, yes. Okay. Uh, I have also a question about, uh, uh, I, I have several questions, in fact. Uh, so uh, first, uh, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about the stability of the die. So what is your opinion, uh, uh, Francesco? So if uh, thinking about these uh, assays for possible application, the long-term stability, so have you yeah. checked the stability of the dies? So, uh, so we we have uh, uh, two different things that we should, uh, you know. Um, thanks for the the question. The, the the stability of the dye and the stability of the DNA strand. Um, of course, yeah. The stability of the dye is actually is pretty good. Uh, the, it's not a big problem in this regard, uh, especially because uh, the um, uh, you know these uh, strands are usually. Uh, uh, stored uh, uh, as uh, you know dry uh, powder, and so um, it's not really a big uh, a big problem. For for the DNA strand, it's obviously could be a problem, especially when we use uh, uh, complex samples like blood or serum. Uh, but the good thing is the fact that uh, uh, our our uh, uh, sensors are really rapid, so we have a, a, a you know. Uh, response in few minutes as I show you and during this time the stability of the DNA uh, strands is not really affected so this uh, for now is not a big problem okay so thanks uh, uh, now Cecilia de Carvalho is a professor invited professor in my group she's also asking and thanking you first of course about the grid talk uh, she's asking if uh, uh, you have also, if you have investigated also the use of nanoparticles, quantum dots to amplify the signal uh, related uh, to the interaction. Yeah, that's that's the a good DNA. question. Uh, actually, uh, no, we didn't. We didn't. Yeah. Uh, we are thinking about several ways to amplify the signal, and uh, yeah, nanoparticles and quantum dots could be a way. Although uh, I'm worried about the you know the size of the of the nanoparticles and quantum dots that can affect the um, you know thermodynamic tuning of our system. Uh, we are also investigating the possibility of using uh, enzymes, uh, a sort of you know PCR. Uh, type uh, amplification uh, that that could be uh, really uh, helpful to improve the sensitivity of our approach, which, as I said, is not comparable to ELISA yet, and this uh, for some application is important. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, also, another question from Claudio Parolo, also from my group. He's uh, Marika. <laughs> I know, I know him. Yeah. <laughs> so also, Claudio is thanking you about this great talk, and he's asking about uh, uh, where do you think the field of DNA nanotechnology will be in a few years from now? Any specific direction? Okay. Okay. Thanks for the for the question. It's, it's yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know really. Uh, I, I, I can tell you where I, I, I would like to go. Uh, and and uh, this is actually the um, focus of, uh, of our um, ERC consolidator grant. So we are going into the you know, synthetic biology uh, part of, of DNA nanotechnology where uh, basically we, we can create uh, a genetic circuits that can be you know, applied also in, you know, in in cells or living cells, uh, and these uh, you know genetic circuits can uh, you know respond to different inputs, give signals, uh, release uh, 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 cargos, and so can have different applications. So this is where where we are going right now. Uh, yes, there is another question now by uh, Dr. Andrea Idili. So I'd like to thank again, of course, Andrea Idili, who, who also was the first to contact you. He was your yep. working yep. with you, your PhD student working with us now. So thanks, Francesco, for your great deep talk. I am curious about the kinetics of the antibody-activated DNA nanotubes. The okay. assembly and disassembly process display similar kinetics. If okay. they display similar kinetics, what is the yield of the disassembly process? 
thanks again. So, yeah. Andrea, I know he, he knows very well so yeah, very yeah. Well yeah. what you're thanks. doing. So, thanks, Andrea, for the, for the question. Yes, of course, the kinetics of assembly and disassembly is important. It's actually very different. So, the assembly is usually uh, slower because it requires you know, hybridization of different uh, tiles. Uh, the disassembly usually is much faster because uh, you know, it's, it's just the hybridization and uh, it, it really happens in a, in a short time. Um, the yield of the disassembly process is, is as, as I show you, uh, very, very high. Uh, and, uh, and we can basically disassemble all the nanotubes uh, that we can observe in, uh, uh, in, in a rapid uh, time. Okay, so there is another question uh, from Laura Valle. Uh, do you know if these DNA self-assembling structures have been tried for some uses like synthetic uh, ribose switches? Okay, okay. That's a nice, a nice question. Yeah, Medellin, Colombia. So yeah, yeah. Laura, yeah, it's nice to hear the people that are hearing this from Colombia. So it's yeah, very nice. nice. Thanks, uh, Laura, for the, for your question. Uh, I actually don't know. I, I know that uh, there is, you know, a very uh, big interest in synthetic ribos, which is this is what I I also mentioned when I was talking about uh, synthetic biology and genetic circuits. Uh, I don't know of any, you know. Uh, DNA structures used for this purpose. So this could be actually a nice idea. Okay, so we have another question uh, from Jose Manuel uh, uh, Rodriguez of Lausino. I think Jose is uh, from Brazil. Uh, so thanking you first of all. Uh, there is a size limitation for the antigen conjugated to the DNA. Have you ever you have you ever used large proteins or only pe peptides? Okay, that's an excellent question. So thanks, uh, Jose Manuel. Um, you're right. What I show you today was just using uh, small molecules as antigens or peptides, like uh, short peptides, uh, around 10, 12 uh, amino acids. But obviously, you know, many important antibodies recognize bigger. Uh, you know, portion of the of the uh, proteins. For example, uh, anti uh, you know COVID nineteen antibodies recognize a quite a big epitope of the spike protein. So um, we never tried with uh, entire proteins, uh, and this is something we are actually uh, you know thinking about. Uh, maybe even for COVID nineteen. Uh, antibody detection. So um, uh, obviously, when we, if we use a larger protein, this can affect the interaction of the DNA strands, and so we have to take this uh, into consideration. But uh, this is a very good question, and we are working on this. Uh, I see there is no question written. I will take advantage to ask another question to you, Francesco. Uh, if yeah. I am not wrong, you said that. Uh, the sensitivity for the, the antibodies detection is still not uh, that uh, better than uh, ELISA, right? Yeah. And you are thinking on uh, probably uh, amplification strategy. But my question is, uh, without um, amplification strategy, do you think there is a room for improvements so you can get better sensitivities? That should be one of the advantages of this approach in comparison to ELISA? Uh, I think without amplification, there's not much room for improvement because we are limited by you know, instrumental limitations. So for example, for fluorescence uh, detection, we have to use a concentration of probe that is in the nanomolar concentration. Lower than this, we cannot detect any fluorescence signal. Okay. So it's really an instrumental limitation. Um, what I can say is that for some applications, for example, monitoring of immunotherapy, the sensitivities that we reached are enough, you know, are good enough, because the level of antibodies is, is actually pretty high. Um, for other applications, we are just, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, borderline, and, and so having an amplification step will be actually uh, very good. Uh, how to obtain this, we still don't know. Uh, okay. There are many ways to many ways to, to you know amplify a signal maybe using antibody uh, enzymes is is the best one okay 
So uh, there is another question, probably should be the last one because uh, yeah. again from Cecilia. Uh, and in case of the electrochemical detection, what is the sensitivity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's another nice question. So um, we, we uh, I, I didn't show you uh, today, but we adapted uh, some of these platforms for electrochemical detection. So instead of, you know, fluorescence, we use uh, uh, electrochemical tags, and so we can detect uh, an electrochemical signal in the presence of the antibody. Uh, actually, the um, sensitivity is very similar. Uh, it's, all, it's also in the nanomolar range, and also in this case for instrumental limitations. So also for electrochemistry, we have to find amplification steps. Okay. Uh, so I, there is another question by Mina Nambari, also acknowledging you, thanking you about the talk. As a material scientist, I would like to know how easy it is to find suitable recognition molecules for different antibodies. Okay, yeah, thanks for this question, Mina. Uh, it's actually quite easy. So uh, the majority of you know, clinically relevant antibodies are very well characterized. So we know where they bind. Uh, we know the region of the protein that they bind. As I, I, I made the example of the COVID-19 antibodies, <clears throat> diagnostic antibodies, we know exactly where they bind. Uh, but as I, as I said before, sometimes they bind a, a, a very large portion of a protein. Uh, other, ty uh, other times they bind a very defined and small portion. And so we can extract uh, a, a, a small uh, peptide sequence. And, and obviously for us, it's, it's easier. Um, so in principle, it's, it's easy to find suitable recognition molecules for antibodies. Okay. okay. So, so I don't see, I don't see any question. Question. Again, Again, thank you very thank much, you very much. Uh, Tesco, for the great talk. Yeah, thanks. And of course, was everybody great. was here hearing. Thank you very much for participation. I'd like to thank again uh, also Andrea, who was the one who gave the idea to, to contact you and contacted you first. So thanks. thank you again, Francesco, and uh, wish you will come uh, in person at ICN2 for uh, another talk in the future, once the situation yeah. will get better. Thank you very much. Have a very nice day, everybody. Bye-bye. Good luck, everybody. Bye.